You're watching a production of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. State House program funding provided by the South Dakota Bar Foundation, the educational and charitable arm of South Dakota lawyers and judges. Welcome to the Governor's Budget Address for 2013. We are coming to you live from the State Capitol and Pier. This is South Dakota Public Broadcasting's live coverage. I'm Stephanie Rissler alongside Kara Hetland. And in just a few minutes, the uh, Governor Dennis Ducard will make his way in and deliver his 2014 fiscal year budgeted address. We really don't know what the governor is expected to talk about. Typically in years past, the governors have given a press briefing to the State House reporters. This particular governor, Governor Dennis Dugard, has chosen not to do that, instead giving a briefing following his address. So what those key issues will be, we won't know until he delivers the address in just a few minutes. But what we do know is that all state agencies needed to present their budget proposals by October 15th. And so that has been in front of the governor and he's been working the numbers and we will be hearing more from the governor and his detailed plans in just a few minutes. And right now what we have happening is the current Speaker of the House, Val Rausch, has taken the podium. Mm -hmm. We have new members here, we have returning members, um, and of course uh, those that were re-elected. So we have a full house on the floor of the House of Representatives, and uh, we do know that the governor is standing by to deliver his speech in just a few moments to this joint assembly of the legislature. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been uh, wonderful eight years I've spent in the House, and a, a very excellent two years as speaker, I've enjoyed it very much. And because of that, I get some unique privileges. And one of those is to introduce to you uh, uh, my first speaker when I was a freshman member of this house. Uh, and he happens to now be uh, uh, our Lieutenant Governor. He's a very dear friend of mine. Would you help me welcome Lieutenant Governor Matt Michaels to the... Thank you very much, and I would say it's great to be in the people's house, but also welcome you uh, on behalf of everyone who works here from the individuals that take care of us through the custodial work and everyone who's made this capital so beautiful, understanding the holiday season. Would you please take this opportunity? This is run, as you know, those who have just been elected and those who will be sworn in in a month and those who are serving. This is run by people who are dedicated to service, and your speaker is certainly that. Would you join me in thanking him for his life of service? It's my privilege to introduce uh, our guest speaker today, uh, under, under our Constitution and our state law requires that the Governor through the Bureau of Finance and Management shall prepare and submit a budget report to you, the legislature with copies to be transmitted to each of you, not later than the first Tuesday of the first Monday of December, immediately preceding the session for consideration with or without amendments and modification by you, the members of the legislature. In addition, our constitutional amendment that was just passed, the governor will speak to, he must propose a budget in which the expenditures or appropriations may not exceed anticipated revenue and existing funds available for expenditure or appropriation. It is an incredible honor not only to have a friend uh, who is the CEO of our state, but somebody of great integrity who really does epitomize uh, the upper Midwest and specifically South Dakota. And 
hard work and compassion all combined in one. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a true privilege to have you welcome the governor of the state of South Dakota and will the sergeant at arms please announce the arrival of the governor of the state of South Dakota. Lieutenant Governor and members of the legislature, the Honorable Governor of the State of South Dakota, Dennis Dugard. very much. Can you hear me now? No? There we go. So that's why you wouldn't pay attention earlier. Thank you for being here today. Uh, today's our opportunity to, be, to begin the discussion about the state budget as I offer my proposal for fiscal year 2014. Uh, before I do that, I want to take a moment to recognize some people here. This is the first time we've been together as a body since the November election, and a new legislature will be sworn next January. Many new legislators are here today, and I welcome you to peer. Also with us today, and those I really want to recognize, are some who will not be returning next year. They are friends who have served us and our state well, and I'd like us to thank them for their service, if you'd join me in doing that. I also would like to uh, say a special thank you to Jason Dilgis and everyone with the Bureau of Finance and Management Putting together this budget is no small task, especially when you consider they need to project revenue and expenses for a period that begins today and ends in June for the fiscal year 13 proposed amendments and then begins in July of next year and ends fully 19 months from now. So they're projecting way out in the future and that takes some talent and some courage and I'd like you to thank me. I know Jason is, where is Jason? Back in there, Jason's back there, and some of his staff are here, and Liza's here, and uh, Collins here. Let's give them a round of applause, if you would. <laughs> Today, I'm offering to you my proposal for fiscal year 14. I'll begin by talking about where we've been and then I'll share some information about our economic situation and follow that with a look at our revenues for the current year and then for the following year, fiscal year 14. I'll discuss my proposals for ongoing spending in fiscal year 14 and ongoing adjustments in the year we're in right now, fiscal year 13. And then I'll discuss my proposals for spending one-time dollars, dollars we don't expect to recur. We're fortunate to have one-time dollars to spend this year, and although I'll be offering some ideas, you'll see I've also left some of that decision-making to you without any suggestions from me. Let's begin by looking at what we've done together. The budget I'm proposing to you today will be a balanced budget, like every budget in the history of our state. Last year, we proposed to the voters a constitutional amendment to add a clear requirement to our state constitution that requires a balanced budget. And this principle is the bedrock of our state's financial strength, and I'm proud it passed the legislature and was approved by an overwhelming uh, vote by the people. Why did we need to do that? Some ask that question. Virtually all the states have a constitutional 
or statutory requirement for a balanced budget. Many, however, balance their budgets only nominally. It's balanced, but in a way that really can't be reliably sustained. Let's look at some of the ways other states balance their budget. Some states balance their budget by accounting methods which push expenses into the next year. 30 years ago, Minnesota did that. They couldn't balance their budget, and even though their fiscal year was ending at the end of June, they could only afford to give their schools about 70% of what they owed them under the state formula funding. So they gave them that 70, and then the other 30 the next year. They did that 30 years ago, and they haven't been able to undo it. So every year, the schools are getting 30% of their funding late, and then 70% more in any given year. A lot of states push their expenses into a future year. Another common trick is to push the last payroll of the year into the next year. So instead of having, if you have two payrolls a month, instead of having 24 payrolls in a year, you push that last payroll into the next year and you have 23 and oh surprise, now we're balanced. The flip side of delaying a payment is booking future revenue ahead of schedule. That's what Texas came up with just this budget year that they're in right here. They're in a biennial year. To close a mammoth budget gap over the next two years, Texas devised a plan to collect some taxes sooner. Under that deal, Texas large in, uh, retailers pay some of their sales tax collections early. That added $231 million to this budget, but it also robbed next biennial budget of that same amount. Some states use an asset sale against their ongoing expenses. It's like selling your car to pay your utility bill. It works once, but then what do you do? You don't have that asset anymore. I know many of you are going to remember that just over 10 years ago, South Dakota settled a lawsuit against tobacco companies, and we sold to bondholders the right of the revenue stream that tobacco companies promised us. And that gave us a lump sum of money. And what did South Dakota do with it? We proposed and voters agreed to put those dollars into the Educational Enhancement Trust Fund. And those dollars have grown from over $300 million to closer to $400 million today. That trust fund throws off earnings or distributions virtually every year into perpetuity to support education. You know, Minnesota did the same thing. Maybe you were aware of that. They sold their tobacco settlement proceeds. What did they do with their lump sum? They used it to balance the budget that year. That money's gone. Many, many states have balanced their budgets over the past decade by making inadequate contributions to their public pension plans. Virtually every public employee in South Dakota is under the state retirement plan. Policemen, teachers, university professors, uh, DOT truck drivers, every public employee that has a pension plan, with the exception of Sioux Falls, whose employees going forward will be on this plan, uh, they're on the South Dakota retirement system. Many states have balanced their budgets by failing to make adequate contributions to those pension plans to meet the promises that they've made to those employees that when they retire, there will be an annuity payment in their retirement years. In other words, the amount contributed to the pension plan was less than the amount actuaries say should be contributed. Illinois hasn't contributed the appropriate amount in 30 years. The Morningstar investment research firm just last week published a report that judged 21 states' public pension plans are not fiscally sound. Remember Illinois? They were at the bottom of the list, 43% funded. The best was Wisconsin, 99.8% funded. South Dakota, number three at 96.3% funded. We're not perfect, but every year we make the contribution actuaries suggest, and we're always adapting to the changing interest rate environment and keeping our plan fiscally sound. We aren't one of those 21 states that are out of whack. The point I'm making with all these examples 
is that a state budget can be balanced nominally in name alone, or it can be truly balanced, structurally, correctly, and in spirit balanced in a way that covers ongoing expenses with conservative estimates that we can rely on of ongoing revenues. Maintaining that kind of balanced budget hasn't always been easy. When I came into office two years ago, many of you here with me made courageous decisions to bring our expenses into line with ongoing revenues. And our budget is structurally balanced. Ongoing expenses are covered fully by ongoing revenues, and that's something we can be proud of. By acting responsibly, we're building a South Dakota that's structurally sound. And a balanced budget is part of that, but it's not the only part. Building a stronger South Dakota, we're structurally sound because we've restored structural balance. We don't defer expenses or accelerate income. We use conservative revenue and expense projections. We don't always appropriate every dollar that's available. And the state agencies, under my direction, haven't spent every dollar that's appropriated either. We save our reserves for emergencies, and we replenish them when we're able. In short, by making cautious decisions and applying South Dakota common sense, we're building our state for the long term. My focus today is on this theme, the structural soundness of our state. Now, as I prepared this budget proposal, I saw that we're going to have some revenues that are not expected to recur in the future. They're one-time revenues. I believe we should expend these one-time funds for things that strengthen our state in one of four ways. We should eliminate a liability, build or improve an asset, secure an asset, or endow a program for the future. You'll see some of these uses of one-time monies that I propose uh, in the budget offering I display today. And I'll return to these points later in the proposal, and I hope you'll consider them during the coming, coming session as well. We owe it to South Dakota to use the revenues we have available to improve the structural soundness of our state for future generations. With these thoughts in mind now, let's look at some economics. The United States economy is recovering, but is not yet recovered. These four charts show how the recession has impacted four key indicators and how they've performed since 2007. Look at the upper left-hand graph. The U.S. real gross domestic product is the only indicator shown here that surpassed the pre-recession level. Real GDP peaked at $13.3 trillion in 2007. In late 2012, almost five years later, real GDP is at $13.6 trillion, which is a growth of total 2.3% uh, since that re pre-recession peak five years ago. In the other chart the, on the right, U.S. jobs declined by 8.8 .8 million jobs during the recession, and only 4.5 million have been added back. So we've only recovered about half of the jobs lost nationwide. Lower left-hand U.S. housing starts declined from nearly 1.5 million starts on an annual basis in early 2007. And in the third quarter of 2012, housing starts were just 786,000 units on an annual basis, just about a little over half of where they were in early 2007. The U.S. unemployment rate on the bottom right hand remains high. It jumped up uh, to 7.9%. Uh, uh, excuse me, 7.9% now compared to 4.5% in early 2007 before the recession. The bottom line is the national economy isn't healed yet, and so we need to be cautious going forward. These charts show by four indicators that South Dakota's economy has outperformed the United States economy over the past several years. The top left graph shows non-farm employment levels of the U.S. economy on the left axis, and South Dakota numbers are on the right axis on a ratio scale. U.S. employment declined much more sharply during the recession as compared to South Dakota's decline. U.S. employment declined 
6.8% from the peak in 2007 to the trough at the bottom of the recession. 6.8% drop. In uh, South Dakota, we declined less than half as much at 3.1% peak to trough. Next chart, top right, you can see South Dakota's unemployment rate remains significantly less than the U.S. unemployment rate. In October 2012, the most recent figure available, national employment, uh, unemployment rate was 7.9% compared to South Dakota's rate of 4.5%. The two graphs on the bottom show South Dakota's income has grown at a faster rate than the United States over the past four to five years. Now I'm gonna to refer to back to this point, so fix it in your mind. Our income has grown at a faster rate than the United States over the past four to five years. In 2011, our non-farm income grew 5.7% compared to the United States growth of 5%. Our per capita personal income growth, which includes farm income along with non-farm income, made us number one in the United States from 2010 to 2011 in terms of our growth, which was 11.8%. Our strong farm economy was a significant reason. Now that point again is something I'm gonna to return to later. South Dakota's 2011 per capita personal income was 44,217 per person, which is 106% of the national figure of 41,560 per person. Let me say that again. The average income earned, if you divide the total income by the over 800,000 South Dakotans, is $44,000. In the United States, that average is $41,000. We're fortunate that South Dakota's economy continues to outperform the national economy by many measures. Let's take a look at the tax revenues upon which our budget is built. This chart shows projected receipts for 2013, fiscal, fiscal year 2013. That left column is the numbers you adopted when you adopted the budget, that's in law. The middle column shows what we think revenue will be. It's better in most cases than what you adopted. And the right column, of course, is the difference between the two. Several sources have been revised higher. Sales tax is up 6.4 million, mostly because of a strong July number. They haven't been as strong since July, but they are up in general. Property tax reduction fund shows video lottery revenue is up 5.7 million as we're beginning to see some return on investment in new line games that video lottery operators are using. This will be the first year since the smoking ban that we've seen an increase rather than a decrease in video lottery receipts. The third line, contractor's excise tax is up 10.6 million. Last March, you adopted a budget which assumed the passage of Referred Law 14, the large project fund, under that assumption, 7.3 million was allocated for the last half of this fiscal year away from this tax because it did not pass at the ballot box. The estimate for contractor's excise tax is now higher by 7.3 million. The remaining increase of 3.3 million is due to growth in construction activity. The ongoing bank franchise tax is down 3.3 million. Our bank franchise tax has been very volatile lately due to some of the changes in federal banking law and FDIC requirements. That number, the 22.9 number, is offset below by a negative 16.6 as a negative one-time receipt as we're uncertain when this revenue source will get back to normal. And we're gonna discuss this in more detail later. Charges for goods and services is up 2.6 million on an ongoing basis, mainly due to higher unclaimed property receipts. There is also one-time unclaimed property revenue that is shown below the line in one-time receipts. I'll discuss that in more detail later also. Total ongoing receipts, total ongoing receipts, up 24 million compared to the adopted estimate. One-time receipts are up a net, a net of five million. This is a combination of a positive one-time receipt of 12.6 million in unclaimed property, one-time receipts of 1.7 million from refinancing bond gains, 
2.4 million from miscellaneous national court case settlements, a 4.1 million transfer from the tax relief fund, and a 1.8 million transfer from the budgetary accounting fund. All those increases are offset by the one-time reduction I mentioned earlier, 16.6 .6 million one-time reduction of bank franchise tax. Again, more about that later. In total, the revised one-time collections total to six million, five million up above where uh, it was when the budget was adopted. Total change is 29 million higher than the adopted estimate in total receipts for the current year, the year we're in right now, fiscal year 2013. Now let's look at 2014, beginning next July. On this chart, the left-hand column was carried over from the prior chart. It's the revised numbers, the revised numbers. The middle uh, column, of course, is what we're predicting, uh, rev predicting revenue will be from the period July 1 of next year through July 30 of fiscal year 14. Fiscal year, again, runs July 1 to June 30 of the following year. Growth is expected in all categories sales tax, property tax reduction fund, which you know is video lottery money, contractors excise tax and insurance company tax are the big four. The ongoing bank franchise tax, we're showing, again, ongoing, we're showing estimated at 23.2 with little growth for fiscal year 2014. And again, I'm offsetting that with another negative 16.6 .6 million of the revenue as a one-time negative down below. And again, I'm gonna explain why that was done a little bit later. Charges for goods and services are up 15 million on an ongoing basis. In fiscal year 2014, due to some bank reorganizations, we expect we will begin receiving new ongoing unclaimed property revenue of approximately 15 million more every year. And I'm gonna talk more about unclaimed property in another chart later. Other ongoing receipts include alcohol taxes, cigarette taxes, severance taxes, licenses, permits, and fees, among others. Total ongoing receipts are up 63 million compared to the revised uh, 2013 numbers. One-time receipts for 2014 are a net increase of 12.6 million. This net includes the one-time receipt of unclaimed property, which I mentioned a bit ago, estimated at $29 million, and offset by a one-time negative, the 16.6 .6 bank franchise number I talked about earlier. In total, we expect a net of 12.6 million one-time receipts. That's 6.6 .6 million higher than the revised 13 number. We're not gonna use cash carry forward for 2014 as we did last year, leaving total receipts of 1,333,000,000 in revenue for next year's budget year. That's 41 million higher than fiscal year 2013, including both ongoing and one-time receipts. Let's recap now, because it's important to understand ongoing revenue if you want to be attentive to the structural deficit. When you left after adjourning last year, you left 16 million on the bottom line, if you recall. Of that, nine million was ongoing. Now I've just told you that we believe revenue in an ongoing, in, in ongoing categories is going to be up 24 million for the year we're in right now. We're five months into fiscal year 13. And then next year we believe it'll be, ongoing revenue will be up still 63 million more for a grand total of 96 million in ongoing revenue that is available to expend in ongoing expenditures in fiscal year 14. By ensuring our revenue growth is probable rather than hopeful, we've been able to use fiscal year 13 ongoing revenue growth to uh, offset ongoing spending in fiscal year 14. Without this, we'd only be able to propose $63 million in ongoing spending. I need to talk to you more in depth about the revenue the state derives from our banking sector. The past few years have been a time of instability in the banking industry in South Dakota and around the world. The economic collapse of 2008 saw the failure of several prominent banks. And in response, Congress passed the Dodd-Frank Act. 
That law has prompted a wave of bank restructurings across the nation. In South Dakota, two of our larger multi-state banks have undergone mergers or changes in their charters. Other multi-state banks have moved operations to South Dakota. Overall, I believe these changes have been good to South Dakota. Our business climate is attracting banks to our state. But one consequence of this change is that South Dakota and the banks are grappling with how to calculate taxes on their bank income. A very changed structure. These banks are national organizations and they need to apportion their nationwide income among all the states in which they do business. This discussion is ongoing and I'm confident that we'll ultimately see this revenue stream stabilize. And I'm hopeful that will be clarified before the end of the legislative session. But I do not know yet today. Let's take a look at some history of the bank franchise tax. This chart shows 10 years of our bank franchise tax. And as you can see, in the last 10 years, our best year for this tax was $42 million. A worst case would be nearly zero. I think neither is likely to occur this year. And the next chart shows how we calculated an, an estimate based on history and statistical analysis. And what we're after is how are we going to figure out what's our ongoing revenue from franchise tax that we should use to guide us as we consider ongoing expenditures. This chart attempts to show how we computed an amount to assume for bank franchise tax. Again, I want to stress that while we're counting on this revenue source to return to an ongoing revenue source, we're subtracting any ongoing numbers down below until we can determine the future state of our bank franchise receipts. So we're showing them up in ongoing and we're taking them away below. In the box shown on the left, upper left, you can see again the 10 year history of the tax, same information you saw in the bar chart in the last chart. In the last 10 years, our best year again was 42 million, our worst year was nearly zero. For today, I asked the folks at the Bureau of Finance and Management to calculate an estimate that looks at our historical averages collected and then make some conservative assumptions going forward. We took the average of the 10 years, which is $27.7 million. Then we looked at the variances and computed the standard deviation. That is, of all the uh, collections, 68% fall within a fixed range. That range is plus or minus $11.1 .1 million. If we assume a standard bell curve as our distribution of future collections, we can subtract one standard deviation from the mean and be 84% confident that future ongoing collections will be at least that high. And the number you come up with doing that calculation is 16.6 .6 million. So that's the number that's in the ongoing and that's the number I also subtract below because we're uncertain about what it will be near term. But longer term, the 16.6 .6, I believe is a very reliable figure upon which we can be uh, relying. Uh, the effect of this is we're, going be, we're being conservative, counting on zero from this tax net for fiscal year 13 and 14, but we're projecting that it'll be restored to at least 16.6 .6, in future years budget. And if for some reason the changes in national law and bank restructuring result in a condition that appears otherwise, I will come to you and ask you to amend our bank franchise tax laws so that we get to where we need to be. Now the state also derives revenue from banking operations through unclaimed property. The news here is better. In all states, banks sometimes lose contact with their customers. You might establish a bank account and then leave town and you forget you left five, 10, 100 bucks in the account. Or you might have a credit card and you overpay your credit card and then you, just, you forget that there's that credit balance and you decide to abandon that card and you use a different card. Or for whatever reason, banks end up with some accounts where they have a modest amount of money and they can't find the customer. Those banks hold these unclaimed bank accounts for a period of years fixed by law while they try to find their customers. They can't spend that money, they can't use the interest on that money, they just have to hold it for their customer and look for their customer. 
if the owner cannot be found after the fixed period of years in law, these unclaimed property assets are turned over to the state. That's why the treasurer puts in the paper, goes to the state fair looking for people. Hey, Joe Smith of uh, South Dakota, we think we've got property that is owed you. That's where that's from. Traditionally, unclaimed property deposits into South Dakota, South Dakota's general fund were a few million. However, in recent years, as banks have merged or moved their headquarters to South Dakota or their charter to South Dakota, we've been the beneficiary of more and more national unclaimed property that cannot be attributable to any one person or state. Therefore, because we're the headquarters, the unclaimed property is turned over to the state of South Dakota. This chart shows the history of unclaimed property receipts coming to South Dakota since 2003. The ongoing revenue is represented by the blue bars at the bottom. They look almost purple in this uh, projection. One of the bank restructurings that I mentioned resulted in a one-time payment of unclaimed property in the current fiscal year 13 year, the year we're in right now. And that's represented by the green bar in fiscal year 13. We did anticipate that payment, but it ended up being a lot larger than we thought it would be. So there's some one-time money that popped up in the current year. Another bank restructuring undertaken recently will cause still additional unclaimed property to accrue to South Dakota in 2014. That's represented by the light blue bar, the checkered bar, and that will be ongoing starting next year. We'll also be receiving a one-time increase in unclaimed property in fiscal year 14, represented by the longer green bar on the right. In the past, you might remember South Dakota banks were told to hold unclaimed property for five years while they looked for their customer. If they couldn't find their customer after five years, turn it over to South Dakota. This five-year period was set in South Dakota law, and then I learned that neighboring states most of our neighboring states had a three-year law. So last year, I proposed, and you agreed, to change our law to a three-year statute. So next year, we will get five-year-old property, four-year-old property, and three-year-old property. And that's the five- and the four-year-old property, the one-time uh, bump, is represented by that green bar. In years after that, we'll just uh, revert to a three-year-old property, and it'll, it'll drop down again. The one-time amount by that uh, upper right-hand green bar is 29.2 million. In summary, although the changes in banking have created uncertainty in the bank franchise tax, which I think we can uh, correct, they have increased our revenue stream on both a one-time and an ongoing basis for unclaimed property. Now that we've talked about revenue, let's look at the other side. Let's look at expenses. As we approach new spending, again, we need to invest our revenues cautiously and in targeted areas that have long-term sustainability. One-time dollars should be spent in accordance with those principles that I outlined earlier. Eliminate a liability, build or improve an asset, secure a current asset, or endow a program for the future. We need to continue to be conservative in estimating revenue in order to maintain our structural balance over the long term. Remember, when I first came into office, in the prior four years, we had every year overestimated our revenue, and actual revenue came in below projections. Our worst overestimation was when we overestimated revenue by more than $50 million. We've got to be careful going forward, and we have been careful in the last two years. Let's continue to that. Once again, I'm proposing a budget that's structurally balanced. Here's a summary of the ongoing increases that I'm proposing, which, if you agree, will become part of the base budget. I'm proposing 3% for state aid to K-12 education and special ed. And this follows the formula funding for the K-12 per student allocation. I'm also proposing 3% for the technical institutes following their formula. Uh, the Board of Regents does not have a formula funding uh, policy, but instead they make specific requests for specific things. And last year they received a 1.4% request increase, rather, and this year I'm recommending funding for specific items which total a 3.2% increase, and I'll talk more about those 
items later. The formula we use for Medicaid would require a 1.8% increase for inflation. In the K-12 funding formula, we look back at historical inflation. Inflation went up for a while, and now it's come back. You may have seen that in the chart earlier. Went up for a while, came back down. It's around 2% now. Uh, since you're looking historically at K-12, historically inflation over the past several years has been 3%. Prospectively, it's judged to be around 1.8%. Notwithstanding that, I'm recommending the same 3% increase as K-12 and others. Finally, I'd propose a 3% cost of living adjustment for state employee salaries. And I'm going to go into some of these things in more detail. Many of you are going to recall, as an aside, I want to mention that in the last two budgets, we used one-time funds to soften the effect of the budget cuts. Remember, most places were cut 10%, schools were cut, I think, 8.6%. But one-time funding prevented any of those recipients from falling to that level. Medicaid providers did not fall to a 10% cut because one-time funds uh, helped avoid that. K-12 did not fall to the 8.6% cut because one-time funds in the last two years prevented that from happening. This year we're, we're returning to formula increases and have funded increases of 3% for each of these categories, but I'm not proposing the use of one-time funds to augment any of these increases for this year. Let's talk about the education increases. This breaks down the funding for education. State aid education is $15.8 million to general education funding on the funding formula, increase of 3%, and also recognizing some enrollment increase projection. Special education would increase $6.3 million uh, based on a 3% increase and also an al aligning the base with increased need. So part of it's inflation, part of it's realignment of increased need. The Board of Regents proposal is a 3.2% is 5.3 million. That's on top of the proposed salary increases I want to talk to you about in a moment. The 5.3 figures include, includes 1.9 million to establish a physics program, a doctoral PhD program in physics at USD and School of Mines in support of the Sanford Underground Lab. It also includes 1.7 million for maintenance and repair funding. 1 million for research at the Ag Experiment Station, and half a million to pay physician assistant preceptors. Tech Institutes uh, proposed 650,000 in increased funding for 3% and also for enrollment increases. Again, this is on top of proposed salary increases I'll talk about in a minute. The uh, other education is technology, sparsity, and consolidation incentives. Education is this first big category of spending, a total of $28.6 million, uh, $28 million. A second large spending category is medical assistance, uh, including Medicaid. If a frail elderly person enters the nursing home and can't pay, they're placed on Medicaid. You know the nursing home sends that bill to peer. We pay that bill partly with federal money and partly with state money. The next graph I'm going to display will show the average percent the federal and state governments each pay for Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, and others. It's a blended F map. Mostly it's Medicaid, and I'm just going to call it Medicaid for simplicity. Let's take a look. On this graph, the red line shows the percentage of each Medicaid dollar paid with federal money. So if the nursing home bill was 10,000 bucks, then 60% of it in 2008 was paid by the federal government. And about 40% of it, or a little less, was paid by the state government. The blue line, of course, shows the state paid percentage. As you can see, as I mentioned, in 2008, South Dakota was shouldering a little less than 40% of each payment. The federal government was paying the rest. Then the recession hit, and stimulus funding passed by Congress relieved the burden on all states. The federal government said, we're going to shoulder more of the burden during this recession because states are having a tough go. And so you can see the stimulus money shifted the burden to the, to the federal government away from the state. So our share dropped in 09. It dropped again in 
10, it was still low in 11. And then when the stimulus money ran out and we went back to a normalized, we jumped back up again and a little bit higher than we had been in 2008. And then again, remember that per capita income growth. How is Medicaid apportioned between the federal government and the states? Not everybody is this breakdown that I'm showing here. Every state is different. Some states are 50%, 50-50. North Dakota's 50-50. Some states are different. How do they decide who, who pays what? Well, the federal government uses a three-year average of state per capita personal income to calculate each state's reimbursement rate change. If a state average is growing faster than the national average, then the federal government pays less of each Medicaid payment. If the state average is going slower than the national economy, the federal government pays more. Well, what's been happening to our personal income? It's been going faster growing faster than the federal per capita income. And as I mentioned, in 2011, it rose by 11.8%, the highest rate of growth in the nation. So because our three-year average of per capita personal income is growing faster than the US average, the federal FMAP rate, their share of Medicaid expenses, is going down by 2.73%, and our share is going up by 2.73%. You can see we're getting closer and closer to that 50% mark, and at the rate we're going, because 2011 numbers are gonna be included not just in this year's three-year calculation, but in next year's three-year calculation, and the following year's three-year calculation, unless we really go upside down in South Dakota, odds are very high that we'll be at a 50-50 share by 2016. Every percentage point of match costs the state over $7 million in general funds. So let's see how that FMAP change impacts the budget this year. This breaks down the funding for medical assistance, mostly Medicaid, and the top one, top line, that $20 million expense, our new FMAP raises our blended rate to 45.8%. That means $20 million in lost federal funding that is replaced with $20 million of state. We're not getting we're not serving any more people. We're not paying our providers any more money. We're just using more state dollars than, and fewer federal dollars to pay the same bills. So that's just a shift in uh, burden from the federal government to us this next year. The second line, as I mentioned earlier, I'm proposing a 3% inflationary increase on average to medical providers. This costs 13.2 million. So if you paid X dollars to set a broken arm of a Medicaid eligible patient, next year you'll get paid X dollars plus 3% would be a one way to look at it. Then look at the third line. South Dakota has 116,000 South Dakotans on Medicaid or the Children's Health Insurance Program. More enroll every month. The rate of enrollment has slowed as the recession recedes, but we still see some enrollment growth. In addition to more people coming onto the rolls, those who are on the rolls tend over time to use services more and more. So the Medicaid enrollees who went to the doctor 10 years ago, they tend to go to the doctor more today than they did 10 years ago. So that's utilization growth. So between enrollment growth and utilization growth, we're predicting we need another $4.4 $4 million. $4 million. Add other medical assistance, of like food services, utilities, bond payments, and we have a total increase of over 39 million to support only the current program. And I'll, I know some of you have expressed support for expanding our Medicaid program, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But I wanna emphasize this dollar increase just supports our current program and adds 3% inflation. As part of the state employee compensation recommendation, I'm proposing a 3% across the board increase, including market adjustments for career band families where our compensation is significantly below the market. This is something you supported last year and I'm asking you to continue your support. I'm also proposing a 3.5% movement toward job worth for employees covered under the performance and compensation equity program and zero to 4.5% performance-based increases for career band employees. Again, this is something you supported last year. This career bands, some of those uh, 
salary levers, levels were way out of the market. I mean, IT and some of our engineers were just way out of the market, and we need to do some things to start moving back closer to the market. For the employer contribution to employee health insurance, I'm recommending seven and a half million. That's an increase of 14.7% in health insurance costs to keep the program from incurring an under-recovery. Nationally, since 2008, employer contributions to health plans have grown 40%. Our state contributions have grown 14%. We had a pretty optimistic belief about how we'd be able to control costs. We had some programs in last year's health management uh, effort that we believed would result in some costs, and they're starting to show some cost savings as a result, but they're not occurring at the rate and at the level that we expected, and so we are not putting enough money into the plan and we're going backwards. So um, also we've shifted about $12 million in costs to the employee. One way of addressing increased claims is put more money into the plan. Another way to address it is force the insureds to pay more in the way of deductibles or co-pays. And we've done that to the tune of 12 million. Ours is a self-insured program. We don't buy it from an insurance company, we insure ourselves. We set aside a certain amount of money every year which we believe will cover the claims. That's not happened. In our fiscal year 13 budget, we underestimated our health care costs and so this increase we'll uh, address it from fiscal year 14 going forward. And I have a one-time request to fill the hole for the current year that you'll see in a minute. Let's look at the next chart. Now those three categories uh, make up the vast majority of proposed FY14 increased ongoing spending. We have a little room for new ongoing spending, but not much. As we consider new ongoing spending, again, I want to encourage us to follow responsible principles. We also have opportunities for one-time spending. And again, we want to promote structural soundness with those one-time expenditures too. Let's look at the, the bigger picture now. I already talked about the first three. Education's 28.6 million, medical assistance 39 million, state employee 20 million. What's left in ongoing spending? Criminal justice initiative. We propose to spend 3.4 million of new ongoing money. Earlier this year, I joined with Chief Justice Gilbertson and Senate Majority Leader Olson and Senate Majority, or excuse me, House Majority Leader Lust to convene a work group. Brian Gosh was at the initial uh, gatherings, uh, speaker-elect Gosh, and um, or presumptive speaker-elect, I guess, um, to work on our criminal justice system. The goals of this work group were to increase public safety hold offenders more accountable through community supervision, and reduce correction spending. Last week, the work group issued its final report. I hope some of you have seen that. And I appreciate, appreciate the careful thought and study they put into the process. Many of their proposals are policies we should consider, and I'll discuss them in the State of the State Address next month. The recommended FY14 budget includes funds to expand drug courts, strengthen probation and parole, and build our capacity to deal with behavioral health and addiction issues. I believe spending these dollars now may, along with implementing statutory and procedural and policy reforms, I believe it should significantly save more dollars in the years ahead. Again, I'll discuss more of this in the State of the State, but I ask your involvement in studying these things, evaluating the facts and the uh, uh, proven uh, evidence-based practices upon which they're founded and judging with me whether they are worthy of support. I believe they are. The fifth line item proposes to spend nearly 2.8 million for maintenance and repair. Going back in history a little bit, in earlier years to balance our state budget before I became governor, we departed from a policy that used to set aside 2% of our total building values set aside 2% to use for maintenance repair. So if we had a building worth $100,000, we'd set aside 2,000. And then that would be available for maintenance and repair. Uh, in an effort to cut our budget, we reduced that to 
and I'd like to return to that policy. So I'm proposing gradually returning to this approach over four years. So fiscal year 14, we'd budget one-fourth of 1% as an ongoing number, planning to add an, another one-fourth of 1% the year following, another one-fourth after that, another one-fourth after that, to get us up to not just 1%, but 2%. The sixth line item proposes new ongoing spending of $600,000, increase for food services based on our service plans, increase for utilities based on our energy manager's projections. The last line before the total combines a number of miscellaneous items, including additional support to legislative audit, support to weights and measures, and other items. You can see that's about half a million dollars. These are all proposed fiscal year 2014 ongoing expenditures. The following three slides are gonna discuss amendments to the fiscal year 13 budget. This is 14 we just talked about. We're gonna go back now and look at the year we're in right now, fiscal year 13, we're five months into it. Let's look at where we are. A few of the adjustments that we're gonna talk about are mid-year adjustments where revenue or expenses has differed in our five months of experience from what we projected last March. Others that you'll see are proposals that I offer to spend one-time money and I have additional proposals to spend one-time money in FY14 that you'll see also in a minute. Again, I believe that one-time money is an opportunity to strengthen our state's structural soundness. And again, I'll repeat it. Well, how should we spend one-time money? This is my philosophy. We should defray a liability. We should build something. We should improve the stability or, or uh, secure something that we have already built or we should endow something that will be perpetually available and throw off earnings for some program for uh, perpetuity. Those are my philosophies about one-time money, and they will keep us out of trouble, uh, in, uh, keep us out of a structural deficit. Now, these are the changes I'm recommending mid-year to the current year budget, the FY13 budget, health insurance. I mentioned that we're upside down. We're not setting aside enough money to cover our claims. So there are one-time cash sources and the revenues which offset most of this one-time cost, but you can again see it's about a little, uh, a little shy of $8 million to get us back to where we need to be, and then we're covering the uh, ongoing part in our ongoing expenses that you just saw. Uh, the second item, GOED economic development. I'm asking for $5 million in one-time money to go into the future fund for economic development projects. As you know, the voters rejected the large project refund program, and I respect that decision. Two projects made the decision to invest in South Dakota, relying in part on the availability of that program. They made their decisions after the law was passed, but before it was referred. Once the law was referred, I pledged future funds as backup so these programs could move forward. Bell, Bell Brands in Brookings and Baldwin Filters in Yankton were companies that I pledged future funds so they would make their decision to be in South Dakota, and both companies made that decision to be in South Dakota. I'm asking the legislature to put one-time dollars into the future fund to help meet these obligations. There's two lines there, five million in general, five million in other, it's the same five million. It would be spent by placing it in the future fund and then the future fund would have other fund authority to spend it in uh, uh, distributions to those companies. The Criminal Justice Initiative, I talked earlier about uh, ongoing. This would be a one-time startup costs of 2.6 million for this initiative. Again, I'm hopeful this one-time investment and the ongoing dollars will offset and reduce a future greater liability and avoid construction costs of new prison facilities. State aid to special ed, this covers a shortfall in the state aid to special ed formula this year. The shortfall is primarily due to lower property valuation than projected. And this will eliminate a current liability. Cement, cement plant retirement fund, you know, uh, over 10 years ago, we sold the cement plant and we froze the retirement plan and closed it. But the amount of money that was in that plan has suffered as a consequence of the poor economy. And there's not enough money to make the projected retirement payments. 
You might remember, those of you who were here last year, we put an extra million dollars into this fund as a start. I'm proposing another couple million. The shortfall is to in total between 12 and 15 million, according to the actuary. Um, internal service rates, these are rate increases occurring in the bureaus due to cost increases for operations and a major software upgrade to several departments. The funds are for agencies to cover these rate increases. This will, again, re reduce the current liability and leverage federal funds as well. State aid to general education, this covers the shortfall in the state aid to general education appropriation. It's short because of lower property valuation than was budgeted, and thus state general funds have to make up the difference. Veteran services for higher ed, these are uh, funds that will be available to the higher ed institutes, both Board of Regents and the Technical Institutes to provide veteran services on those campuses. And then finally, the GOED Research Commerce Grants. This is to start a proof of concept grant program. The Board of Regents and the, Board of, or the Governor's Office of Economic Development work, would work together on this. It would support a program to provide small, less than $50,000 proof of concept investments in research that is believed to be commercially viable, where they're trying to turn research into a business. If the commercially successful, the investment would be repaid. If not, then it would be lost. So there's a little bit of risk, but the idea is to encourage commercialization of research and support entrepreneurs right here in South Dakota. Additional proposed amendments, uh, DOE jobs for America's graduates programs, the Department of Education would provide many grants to school districts to help implement the Jobs for America's Graduates program at school districts that are in need. The JAG program is primarily a dropout prevention program. It's been highly successful across the nation to help keep our students in school and on a path to success. Department of Edu Education teacher evaluation software. This would pay for the one-time cost of the teacher evaluation software, which will provide a consistent teacher evaluation tool that can be used at all public school districts across South Dakota. Uniform and consistent evaluation of our teachers is a key component of our education system's new accountability model, and this will provide a tool that school districts can use, they can choose to use, which will meet accountability standards. School districts will be free to create or use alternative, uh, credible tools of their own if they wish, uh, but many districts have requested assistance in this area. DOE sparsity money, this covers a small shortfall in sparsity funding due to more students than budgeted. A technical Institute's MNR, this increase in other funds authority is needed to appropriate maintenance and repair fees to the technical institutes. A BOR budget authority due to an increase in the higher ed facilities fund for MNR and enrollment growth. Uh, the Technical Institute's funding reduction is due to actual student numbers being 179 lower, fewer than budgeted, than budgeted for FY 2013. Therefore, therefore, these funds are no longer needed and can be uh, eliminated from the 2013 budget. Medicaid enrollment revision, we're seeing Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program enrollment growth flattening out. We still see growth but the growth is much more moderate than it was uh, a year ago. And even when we adjourned, we, we weren't confident that enrollment would be as slow as it's turned out to be. And so a lower growth than previously as anticipated is allowing us to, uh, I guess, unappropriate those dollars, if I can call it that. Let's talk about some emergency specials. Now, I don't know that these would be really emergencies in the sense that uh, the uh, fire bell is ringing, but they're uh, two-thirds votes in any course, in any case, and by uh, including an emergency clause, they can be spent uh, sooner rather than waiting till July 1. And this, is, again, is coming from 2013 dollars, so the money would be available. The first emergency special on this slide involves the Human Services Center campus in Yankton. Now, I'm proud that we have a modern first-class facility in Yankton that has served patients since 1996. In 1992, Governor Mickelson proposed replacing 
the outdated and older structures on the Human Services campus with a new facility. And that facility was dedicated in 96 and has been there since and is a very nice facility. I'm sure many of you have been there. But many of the old hospital buildings, now unused, and even some farm buildings that date back a century to when the uh, Human Services Center was an operating dairy farm. They're, they remain vacant on the HSC campus. And some of these buildings, like the Mead Building, are beautiful historic buildings that we should preserve. But as I said in the Yankton paper last July, many others are in significant disrepair and are well past the point of being remodeled or restored. Over the years, studies have been made because we've been in this condition for two decades. Many studies have been completed to seek other uses and options for the vacant buildings, but due to the outdated structures, poor condition, and expense of rehabilitating the buildings, few viable options were found. Now, some of the old buildings have been put to reuse. The Pierce Building is occupied as a trustee unit for the Mike Durfee Prison. The dietary building remains in use for the provision of food service to the trustee unit. The Canner building was remodeled and is the office building for most state agency locations in the Yankton area. If you're going to DSS or some other uh, agency in Yankton, you'll go to the Canner building on the HSC campus. The campus chapel was renovated and turned into a training uh, center. Some buildings are used for storage. So there are some buildings that are being used, but numerous vacant buildings on the old campus continue to deteriorate. I have personally inspected the entire campus on foot. I've been through every building myself, some more than once, some three times. Many of the buildings have leaking roofs, broken windows, animals and birds living in them. They're littered, littered with mold, feces and animal remains. Last summer, I convened a team to evaluate the old campus and offer recommendations. The team determined that while the land is an asset, the vast majority of the buildings are beyond the point of repair and have become a liability to the state. Some are attractive nuisances that are dangerous to trespassers. I support a restoration of the Mead Building, which was the first building at the HSC campus and includes many notable architectural features including a beautiful Italian marble staircase. Through a partnership with the Yankton Historical Society, we can restore this building and make it an asset for the state and the Yankton community. And I also hope that we can save a historic barn and the Burbank building. I propose that the rest of the buildings, which are beyond repair, should be demolished. The easy path would be to do nothing. We have done nothing for two decades. The politically expedient path is to hide from that problem. It's time to face that situation. The easy path would be to do nothing, to allow these buildings to continue to deteriorate and fall into disuse. But I propose we turn from the easy path to the responsible path and address a long developing liability and danger and yet preserve what we can preserve. Now let's look at the remaining uh, emergency specials that I propose to this year's FY13 budget. Wildland fire suppression. We need to backfill the fire fund for wildland fires that have taken place in the past year. As you know, we cannot predict what the expense will be in this category. So we spend into the red and then we backfill the deficit. The state veterans home construction. The general funds will fund a biomass heating unit, which spends more one time but will reduce utility costs over the long haul, so we can use uh, wood chips. The federal funds are 65% of the approved construction package uh, be funded by a federal grant, which we have been awarded, the largest federal grant uh, in this program. The other funds are South Dakota's 35% match and some 100% state-funded state construction. And these other funds, the 14 million, would represent the maximum amount that we would bond and I believe we'll bond less than that. Uh, the Rapid City Wildland Fire Remodel for renovations and improvements of the South Dakota Department of Ag Rapid City Office Facility. This is the old Game Fish and Parks buildings that was vacated when Game Fish and Parks moved into the outdoor center. 
The Department of Ag will uh, remodel it for their use. They're being kicked out of the Rapid City Airport facility where they're uh, leasing. They're required to vacate by December of 2013. The Department of Military land purchase in Sioux Falls is to purchase land from the city of Sioux Falls. We lease some property, but it's not renewed, and we need this land for training exercises, and the Department of Military would like to purchase it. They would also like to use uh, some federal fund appropriation authority to build a motor pool building, again in Sioux Falls. Uh, this would be at the Readiness Center at the Sioux Falls Airport. It would be um, all federal funds. There are currently no vehicles uh, covered from the elements uh, that belong to the motor pool. The water omnibus bill you've seen uh, every year since you've been here. This is a yearly appropriation for water from the water and environment fund, the water pollution control revolving subfund, and the drinking water revolving subfund. It uh, uh, makes loans and grants to local communities for water lines, for sewer lines, and uh, you've seen this bill before. The last uh, item is inmate housing at the state fair. This will provide permanent housing, governor's houses. They would use other funds that are generated, fair admissions or camping fees to pay for uh, some governor's homes that then will be the place where the prisoners stay when they're on site for maintenance. Now let's look at proposed one-time expenditures next year, fiscal year 14. The first one is a, a large $4 million uh, appropriation that would fund three separate projects that I'm calling outdoor heritage projects. They are, um, these would be long-term assets for the state. Two million I'm proposing for the Blood Run Nature area, which is well on the way to becoming, to becoming a valuable, valuable part of our game fish and park system. The funds will develop roads and parking, visitor and day use facilities, offices and a trail system. The state of Iowa is interested in dedicating land across the Sioux River from our land, and this has the potential to be the first two-state uh, state park in America. This would enlarge further this nature area and cultural landmark. 500,000 would be used to seize an opportunity to expand the George Mickelson Trail. The federal government has finally given permission for the state to extend the Mickelson Trail to Mount Rushmore. These funds would begin the development of the 18-mile expansion. Every general fund dollar would be matched with $3 from other sources. $1.5 million would be used for a new theater and visitor center at Custer State Park. It would be matched by Game Fish and Park other funds and Parks and Wildlife Foundation dollars. Every year, more than 1.8 million visitors go to Custer State Park. The theater will improve the experience at the Norbeck Visitor Center and, most importantly, encourage the visitors to stay longer. This has been something that's been tried in other parks around the nation by having a theater that can talk about other things in the park or in the area. You encourage visitors to become interested in those things or aware of those things, either extend their stay or come back again later. These three outdoor heritage projects total $4 million in one-time spending. Let's look at other one-time proposals I'm suggesting for FY14. Pine beetle suppression, $2 million. Last year, I asked for $6 million for the Black Hills Forest Initiative. Our pine beetle suppression efforts have already treated over 290,000 trees and partnered with more than 700 private landowners. And we have been largely successful so far in protecting Custer State Park from the worst of the epidemic. Our flyover map that I hope you'll, you'll uh, ask to see from Game Fish and Parks and from the uh, Black Hills Forest uh, collaboration, collab collaboration Group shows very clearly that Custer State Park has been uh, largely protected from mountain pine beetles thanks to the uh, hard work that we've been doing. But there's still to be done, more to be done in this battle against the beetles. I've met with county commissioners and landowners in the Black Hills, and this year I'm recommending an additional $2 million in funds to continue our beetle suppression efforts. The Sanford Underground Lab at Homestake, the Ross Shaft, I'm recommending $2 million in one-time funds. I spoke earlier about my proposal 
to create a PhD program in physics at our state universities, support the cutting edge research that's done at the, San the Sanford Underground Lab at Home State. I'm proposing we spend $2 million in one-time funds to continue to improve and restore the infrastructure at the lab. The funding will accelerate the work that's being undertaken to rehabilitate the Ross shaft, which is one of the two uh, vertical shafts that give access to the Davis campus where both of the major experiments that are presently uh, underway are located. South Dakota has worked over 10 years to make the underground laboratory a success. It hasn't been easy, but with the opening of the Davis campus and the installation of new experiments, things are moving in the right direction. And I'd encourage every one of you, if you have not gone, to go visit the underground campus on the uh, 4850 level. See the progress for yourself. It's very impressive. The Railroad Trust Fund, I'm proposing $1 million be added to that fund, which makes loans to companies for railroad projects. We need to support agriculture and industrial development. And one way to do that is by providing loans from the Railroad Trust Fund. Monies from the Railroad Trust Fund are loaned out for projects such as sidings or mainline rail improvements, which have a direct impact on economic development in South Dakota. There's many good, worthy projects that would benefit from these funds, and this proposal would be a good start. Tax refunds for the elderly and disabled. This is an annual appropriation for incomes who meet income guidelines. Physician tuition, again, that's, this is dependent upon tuitions locating in rural areas, and this repays their uh, medical school tuition in return for their commitment to stay in these rural areas. This pays for two doctors, one dentist, and one physician assistant repaying their tuition. Clover Hall replacement, that's $4 million in other funds, not general funds, but other funds that would replace the current Clover Hall, two-thirds of which has become unusable at the State Fair. The State Fair Foundation, the, State, uh, the South Dakota 4-H Leaders Association, and others are leading a fundraising effort to replace Clover Hall, and this is an appropriation authority to permit the expenditure of those private dollars on State Fair property. Conservation grants, this will use a portion of gas tax refunds that were formerly available. Last year, you changed the law to make those uh, refunds that would be otherwise available for taxes paid by farmers and ranchers on their property. Instead, the money will now go to, as, as was part of the arrangement last year, make grants to conservation districts to help fight erosion of our soils, lakes, and rivers. State Treatment and Rehabilitation Academy, the Star Academy in Custer State Park. This would provide for uh, construction of a new maintenance building and also demolition of three buildings, one of which is the old maintenance building. And it would use available uh, DOC cash. The new budget bottom line. We've talked about a lot of proposed amendments, and this is what the bottom line would look like in both fiscal year 13 and 14. It shows total proposed revenue and total expenditures in nominal terms, nominal terms. When the FY13 budget was adopted last March, the legislature left $16.3 million on the bottom line. Even with the many revisions I'm proposing, I've left $16.4 million on the bottom line, and I'm offering no proposal to spend it at this time. Similarly, I've left a nominal surplus of $10.2 million on the bottom line for 2014. Again, both of those numbers represent about 1% of the budget for each fiscal year. Because we live in a time of so much uncertainty, I believe we should wait to see what direction is taken by the President and Congress in the next several months and what impact it may have on our economy. Congress may fail to reach an agreement on the sequester cuts and they may take, take effect. If they do, they'll take effect January 2nd. Um, these, uh, if they don't, if Congress doesn't reach agreement on the expiring tax cuts, the combination of tax increases with the cuts expiri expiring, tax increases plus the automatic sequester cuts are believed by most economy, uh, economists uh, to uh, create a recession in uh, calendar year 13. So I think we should wait and see what happens on, on those two fronts. Both of them have deadlines. The tax cuts will expire automatically at the end of this year unless Congress takes action. 
So inaction creates a change. If Congress does not act on the sequester, those sequester cuts will take place January 2nd. So again, inaction will create a change. So by the time you, we reconvene next January, we'll know what has happened on those two fronts. We may not know much more if they just simply defer to a, another date down the road, but um, it's something that is, is cause for concern. One area of great uncertainty I mentioned is the sequester cuts, whether those will come about on January 2nd, and those that cross the board cuts to federal funding could have a significant impact on South Dakota's state budget. Three weeks ago, just three weeks ago, the Pew Center on the States released a report that compared the effect of the sequester cuts on the 50 states. Let's look at their chart. This isn't my chart, this is their chart. The chart evaluates what percentage of total state revenue comes from federal grants which are subject to the sequester. Our state is at the top. Federal grants subject to the sequester make up 10.3% of our state revenue, the highest percentage of any state. The average state gets about 6.6 .6 of its revenue from federal grants. South Dakota, 10.3. But let's do the math. For fiscal year 2013, we adopted a budget which predicted state revenue, including general funds, federal funds, and other funds would total just under $4 billion. That's a budget that's already adopted. You adopted it. Pew is saying the federal grants subject to the sequester make up 10.3% of our revenue. That would be roughly $412 million of grants subject to the sequester. That's not the cut, but that's the total amount of grants subject to the cut. Based on OMB estimates of across-the-board percentage cuts, the federal fiscal information to the states, it's a subscription that we and most states subscribe to, they estimate that sequestration would result in cuts of roughly 7% of federal non-exempt non-defense grants to states compared with fiscal year 2012 funding levels. This is very rough math now, but 7% would be 29 million to South Dakota. So if the cuts take place, our best judgment now is they would result in about $29 million of lost federal funds. What, what happens then? What do you do then? Well, you could do nothing and let those cuts be felt by the programs that would otherwise depend upon them. Or you could replace those uh, cut federal dollars with state dollars. I don't propose one way or the other. I think you need to evaluate that as a policy decision. I'm just saying that if the sequester takes place, $29 million of federal funds will be cut off uh, dollars that you included and expected and put in the budget for the year we're in right now. Now there's been some discussion recently that the lame duck Congress will act to prevent sequestration from occurring, and that may be true, but we should be prepared for cuts that ultimately must come unless taxes are raised dramatically. The federal government cannot sustain current deficit spending, and action must be taken very soon. Now don't go to the next slide. I just want to emphasize this. I'm not being political. I'm telling you, the numbers are significant, and I'm going to show them to you. Let's understand the breadth of this problem. It is big. Federal fiscal year 2012 just ended, September 30th, 10 weeks ago. Federal fiscal year total revenue was about $2.4 trillion, the green bar. We spent about 3.5 trillion. The deficit for the year was 1.1 trillion. So there's the gap. That red bar, if it was stacked on top of the green, would equal the height of the blue, right? The total sequester across the entire nation will reduce spending in the new federal fiscal year, which just began, by about 120 billion. So look at that little tiny cut. That's the sequester including the non-defense, or including the defense part. So that's the whole sequester. So this drastic cut that we want so desperately to avoid is just a tiny sliver of what we need to face. This isn't the accumulated debt. This is just last year. This is just last year. Now let's put this in some numbers because when we talk about 
millions and billions and trillions. My head spins with the zeros. I have to think and count. Let's see, a billion's nine zeros, trillion, that's 12 zeros. It's hard to keep track. Well, let's just cut off eight zeros. Cut off eight zeros and pretend it's your family. And your son or daughter has just taken their first job at a modest salary of 25,000. That's what they're gonna get paid. They're gonna get paid $25,000. And then you talk to them and say, well, I've got a new apartment, I bought some health insurance, bought a new car and the car payment. And well, what are you spending, honey, you say? Well, I'm spending $35,000 a year. Wait a minute, you're earning, excuse me, 24. You're earning 24,000, spending 35,000. Oh my gosh, you gotta cut your expenses or you gotta get another job, you gotta do something. You can't spend 11,000 more than you're making. Um, now, probably you're gonna have to put some of that money on your credit card till you get this straight round. What's your credit card balance? Well, let's look at what the credit card balance would be. The next chart shows the proportion. The credit card balance is 168,000 that your child has, 168,000. That's the debt on your child's credit card. Add those eight zeros and that's our national debt. 100 and, excuse me, 163,000. So that's the, that's the breadth of the problem. This is our debt on the right, our revenue on the green in the left, uh, 24 or 2.4 trillion, spending 3.5 trillion, a deficit of 1.1, and those cuts are so small that you almost can't see them anymore on this chart. So I tell you that because I don't want to be an alarmist. I don't want you to think that I'm being crazy when I say we got to worry about this in the future, because we do. We really have to worry about this. If this were your own personal budget, you'd be very alarmed. So, let's go to the next chart. Because of all these uncertainties, I think we need to be conservative about committing to future ongoing expenses. Beyond the uncertainty in Washington is another area of uncertainty, the optional expansion of Medicaid under the federal health care reform. As you know, South Dakota joined with many other states to challenge the constitutionality of the federal health care legislation. Like it or not, that happened. And uh, the Supreme Court upheld the law, except for the Medicaid part that was to be mandated. The deal was, under the law as written, if you're in the Medicaid program, you have to expand. That's the way the law was written. And the Supreme Court said, no, no federal government, you overstepped your authority, you can allow and make it optional for the states to expand, but you can't require them to extend, expand as a part of maintaining the Medicaid program they're already in. So, I'm not recommending that South Dakota expand its Medicaid program in, uh, in our fiscal year 2014. Our best estimate right now is this expansion would add 48,564 able-bodied adults to the Medicaid rolls, and I wanna stress that. These are able-bodied adults. They're not disabled. We already cover the disabled. They're not children. We already cover children. These are adults, all of them. There are far too many unanswered questions for me to recommend adding 48,000 adults to the 116,000 already on our rolls. Now, in the first three years, the expansion would be 100% funded by the federal government. The claims would be. Not the administration, not if other uh, currently eligible people come on. Those wouldn't be covered 100%, but all the new people be, would be covered for their claims 100%. And that's a lot of the cost in those first years. That's a lot of the cost. Um, then in uh, 2017, the cost changes to 95% paid by the federal government. Then 2018, 94%, uh, 2019, 93%, and then by 2020, it's 90% federal covered, 10% state covered. The state has just obtained a second round of actuarial studies. In fact, I saw it yesterday for the first time to understand some of the impacts of the expansion. And our best estimate is the expansion would ramp up to a state cost of between 43 and 44 million additional dollars by 2020. Be lower than that, considerably lower than that in the first few years. 
but by 2020, we'd be spending about 43 to 44 million more in state dollars. Now, we don't know what will happen after 2020. Will the federal share remain at 90%? Will it drop to 80% or 70%? Will it drop to the FMAP rate? We expect we'll be at 50-50 at that point. We simply don't know. We just don't know. We also don't know if the expansion is an all or nothing. We know it's not a now or never decision. We can decide not to expand in fiscal year 14, which I am proposing we don't expand in 14, and we can still do it in 15, or we could do it in 17 or 18. Whatever the share is on that year, we jump in at that share rate. If we jump in in 2020, we jump in at the 90-10 rate. We don't start at 100%. Just to make it clear. So it's not a now or never decision. We don't know if it's all or nothing. That is, do we have to enlarge the expansion to the entire 48,000 adult population, or can we enlarge to a smaller subset? We're trying to find out the answer to that question. We need good answers from the federal government, and I've joined many of my fellow governors in asking to meet with President Obama about this. And in the meantime, I do not recommend expanding Medicaid in 2014. As still another uncertainty, our largest economic driver, agriculture, suffered a severe drought in 2012, and we don't know when that will end. The National Drought Monitor last week showed over 93% of South Dakota right now is in severe, uh, ex extreme, or exceptional drought, the three worst categories. Conversely, 7% is not in severe or worse drought, 7%. Time will tell what will be the full impact of the drought on our ag producers and how it will affect economic activity in South Dakota. Until we emerge from the drought, I think it would be prudent to remain cautious. And unfortunately, the recession, the uncertainty in the United States, no longer recession but remaining uncertainty, is also seen elsewhere. Last year. Europe slipped back into a recession. This is the first time that Europe's been in recession when the United States has not been. So that's something to worry about. Japan is in recession. China's growth is slowing. So there's lots of uh, unknowns out there. And, and so I, I don't want to, again, uh, seem to be an alarmist, but these are uh, global scale things that we can't be oblivious to. So for these reasons, I've left significant dollars unspent. I'm hopeful we'll know more by the time the FY13 and 14 budgets must be adopted. But before, um, before we conclude, I want to update you on some other things. This is our emergency reserve fund. Uh, the blue line shows a little history combining the property tax reduction fund and the budget reserve fund. Over the past decade, those funds combined have ranged from a high of $160 million in fiscal year 04 to a low of about 87 million last year after you approved the use of 20 million for emergencies, the floods, the fires, the mountain pine beetles. We ended fiscal year 2012 with a nominal surplus of 47.8, so we're able to restore the 20.2 million and add another 27 million, both what we spent and still more. So our reserve balances today total 134.7 million. Now, if you choose not to spend the 16 million I left and you left on the bottom line for FY13, and that went in the reserves, that would go up to 11.9% uh, uh, of our funding, of our spending rather. And if you didn't choose to spend the other 10 for FY14 and it went to the reserves, it would end up with uh, a balance of 161, uh, about where we were in FY04. I'm not suggesting you should do that. I'm just saying that's what would happen. A uh, report by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities is shown on the green line. They recommend reserves should be maintained at 18% of general fund expenditures. Again, that's a policy decision. That's a good thing to debate. I'm not suggesting it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing. I'm just offering it as a, as a benchmark. There aren't many states today that can consider how large should be their reserve funds. That's something that should make us all very proud. 
In my inaugural address almost two years ago, I said that South Dakota could show our sister states and even our federal government that there is a better way. This year, we're considering a balanced budget for the 124th year. We've strengthened our balanced budget requirement with a constitutional amendment. We've replenished our reserve funds after the flooding, fires, and pine beetle emergencies. We're preparing for federal sequester cuts. We've avoided raising taxes. We're improving our financial practices. We're even working to upgrade our credit rating. And Barron's has recognized South Dakota as the best run state in America. I want to thank you for your public service. To those legislators who are not returning, I thank you for your work for our state these past two years and years before. And I know many others in this state join me in thanking you for participating in this great representative government. To those legislators who are returning next year and to the new legislators who will join us, I ask for your continued diligence in the face of an uncertain future. We can face that future with courage, with the knowledge that our predecessors have left a strong South Dakota in our hands. In South Dakota, we know we can't spend and borrow our way to prosperity. We understand you can't think about today's benefits without being concerned and considering tomorrow's consequences. In South Dakota, we know that we have to keep our state structurally sound for the future. That's my focus this year. I hope you'll join me in that focus. It's our duty to the people of South Dakota, and I thank you for your attention. Governor Dennis Dugard has just wrapped up his speech, his recommendations for his proposed budget for fiscal year 2014. Of course, according to Governor Dennis Dugard, the proposed budget allows for more modest and substan sustainable growth. Some of the things that we did hear from the governor, we'll see money going for education, medical services for the poor, and for state employees. Some highlights that the governor talked about. Uh, our economy has recovered better than any other state in America. The governor saying that is because this legislature, some of the, the, the folks that have returned back, they really cleaned up their own fiscal house. As you remember a couple years ago uh, when we had great cuts here at the state level, he said that is why our state is better than any other state in America. Some of the other things talked about today is going to be some of the money that will be left on the table. Once the ballot, the, the budget is balanced in fiscal year 2013, we're going to see $16 million left uncommitted to. In fiscal year 2014, we will see $10 million uncommitted to. What the governor wants to do is have a healthy discussion with the legislature as to where that money will go. He's indicated we do not have to spend every penny of those uncommitted dollars, but they are left on the table. Some of the reasons those mo that money will be left on the table are some emergency situations that we may have to deal with as a state, including the drought si situation, the expansion in Medicaid. Those are some of the things that came up today as Governor Dennis Dugar delivered his proposed budget for fiscal year 2014. Again, this budget will go into effect on July 1st of 2013. It will then run until June 30th of 2014. This legislature will come back together. Well, some of the members of this legislature will come back together in January. They'll begin looking at those numbers, where those dollars will go. Uh, there were some increases that we'll see. Education is expected to get a 3% increase. The Board of Regents will see a 3.2% increase. We'll also see state employees uh, with the cost of living. They too will receive a 3% increase. Again, 
these are all proposals from the governor's office. How everything falls on the table is yet to be seen once this, this legislature uh, comes together and ends in March. But those are some of the things that Governor Dennis Dugard talked today as he did deliver his proposal for fiscal year 2014. If you're just tuning in on TV, radio, or, or online and you missed part of today's speech, it will be archived on our website at sdpb.org. Just go to our State House section. And of course, we will re air this speech tonight on SDPB television at 10.30 Central Time. Right now, what we're doing is we've got uh, Kara Hetland with Public Radio and myself. We're going to be getting some reaction interviews from some of our state lawmakers to see what they think about what Governor Dennis Dugard had to say, what their hopes are as we begin the 2014 legislative session. And I understand Kara Hetland is ready to go with one of our first interviews. Kara. Thanks, Stephanie. And joining me now is Angie Buell, state representative in Sioux Falls. Thanks for joining us. First, your initial reaction to the governor's speech and his proposal. Well, I think it's important to remember that this conversation is not just about numbers on a page, numbers in a budget, that it really speaks to our priorities and our values as a state for where these dollars go and uh, how they're used to impact people's lives. How do you feel about his plan to be very cautious? And we don't have to spend everything that we have. Let's see what happens with the federal government, the recession. How do you feel about taking that conservative approach? Well, I think everyone in the legislature and in South Dakota agrees with a cautious approach. And at the same time, we recognize that there are uh, there's still damage being done from cuts that happened two years ago. And so I think we need to recognize that we're in a generally strong place fiscally in terms of the reserve funds that we have on hand and that caution is always good at the same time that there are people out there who are still struggling. So do you think that we need to spend a little more money to make up what we cut in the state two years ago? I think we need to address the damage that was done from two years ago to use uh, the uh, use that as a base and then move forward from there, especially if we're moving to uh, you know, pre-recession levels in other areas of the budget like uh, state infrastructure and state building repair. Do you think lawmakers can agree on damage that was done? Well, I think that everyone recognizes the, that there was damage done. They've heard from their constituents, they've heard from the small town nursing homes and the clinics that are having a really hard time making ends meet. And they hear it every day just like I do. And so I think that uh, it's just a question of whether we can find the will to dig in and fill in that hole and then move forward from there. How do you feel about just straight across the board 3% increase? I think it's a good jumping off point. I think it's, uh, you know, certainly a better point than we were at when I first came in two years ago and we were looking at, you know, 3% cuts instead of 3% increases. So I'm glad that we're starting at that point, but at the same time, it still fails to recognize that there are still providers and uh, schools struggling out there. Do you think more needs to go to schools and Medicaid than some of the other areas? I think some of the one-time funds could be used to sort of backfill those cuts and then to, uh, you know, get them back to the point where they're supposed to be. I mean, at this point, schools are still at 2005 levels of funding, and I think that's a serious problem for our kids. You know, kids can't repeat fifth grade just because we had a few years uh, of uh, tight funding, and so we got to go back and make sure that we're addressing that and then moving forward from there. All right. Representative Buell, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Back to you, Steph. And I am joined now by Representative Peggy Gibson. She's from Huron. Representative, thanks for being with me today. An interesting speech, what we heard from the governor. First off, your overall thoughts on what you heard. Well, my first overall thoughts is we haven't fixed the problem yet with education and Medicaid. So we need to think about that, seriously think about that Medicaid expansion and those 48,000 people that will be impacted if we don't do the Medicaid expansion. So I'm very concerned about that particular problem. It'll add about $200 million to the South Dakota economy and turnover seven times in the economy. First three years, it would be totally paid for by the federal government. And so many of our poor would be impacted by that decision. I'm hearing mixed thoughts on the one-time funds issue. A lot came up on where some of those one-time funds could or should go. Your thoughts? Those I have, I, I agree more with the governor on. Um, the corrections program is very good. The state park uh, improvements 
money going to the South Dakota State Fair impacts here in and my community and authorizing funds there. So I'm very appreciative of those, the, um, tackling the pine beetle problem, uh, the PhD physics um, degree. I'm very, very pleased with some of those one-time fund monies and agree that they need to be done. I, I like his putting money into our state parks and, and into the state fair and really uh, thinking about boosting our tourism uh, in South Dakota that gives us so many positive reinforcements and, and people coming to our state and making it just better for everyone overall. Okay, those are some issues that obviously will be of importance to you. Anything else that came up today that you're really gonna keep your eye on? Well, just, just mainly the Medicaid uh, expansion money because that's really important. And of course, education and economic development are partners and that's how we're going to move our state forward. Our small businesses establish them, not corporate giveaways. Um, that is one thing that's been very, very important to me. I was a big opponent of House Bill 1230 and certainly referred law um, 14. And don't think New York Times has just done a big study on corporate giveaways and they're not effective. We need to put that money in education. We need to put that money in our health care systems to help our, our poor South Dakotans move forward. All right, before I let you go, you are uh, one returning lawmaker. You're a veteran now. But we're going to have a lot of new faces this legislative session. As your constituents and the rest of South Dakota watches today, what are your final thoughts as you look forward with all these new faces to the 2014 legislative session? I look forward to it with a very positive attitude, working across the aisle, working with my fellow Democrats, working with the second floor, and moving South Dakota forward. So I'm very happy to be back in the legislature. I do feel I have some experience under my belt now, and I can just hit the floor running, and I'm very pleased to be back and, and making good South laws for South Dakotans. All right, Representative, thank you. Thank you. And of course, this is Representative Peggy Gibson from Huron. We'll now throw it back to Kara. Thank you. And joining me now is State Senator Corey Brown from Gettysburg. Thanks for joining us today. And your initial reaction to the governor's speech? Well, you know, I'm, I'm always, uh, it's always good to get this day done so that uh, we can finally get a look at the details that the governor has in his plan. Um, we kind of have a roadmap for what we can expect this next year. And, uh, you know, my initial reaction is that uh, we've went through some difficult years the last couple of years. Um, but I, I think the goal was to try to put in place a structure that allowed nice, moderate growth into the future. And I think what you saw here today were revenue estimates that probably largely reflect that. And so I, I think it's good when we can have those conversations about continuing to move forward when you have a lot of these states that care are, are facing huge deficits again and um, they're looking at additional cuts they have pensions that are underfunded and, and that's not the case here is there any conversation in your caucus about backfilling some of the cuts from a couple of years ago and making that money up i i think um the governor and i think many of us legislators were pretty clear that Two years ago was kind of intended to be a reset. Um, there should not be the expectation that we're necessarily going to just fill those cuts back in uh, because. Now, if there are programs that make sense and clearly there's a return on that investment, I do think as revenues increase, we will continue to put more money towards those things. But, um, you know, I think you even could see here, if you make the inflationary adjustments that the governor has suggested, um, and you look at the anticipated growth in revenue, there's really not a lot of extra ongoing money that's left over by the time you do those things. Do you think 3% is enough for education and Medicaid? I guess that's what we're going to find out in January, isn't it? <laughs> well, what are you hearing from constituents? Um, you know, it, uh, it depends. I mean, interestingly, you know, we just went through an election cycle where the voters... Uh, made it pretty clear they didn't want to see a massive increase to education or to Medicaid. Um, yet I think there are reasonable places where um, we have to continue to look at putting additional funds there because it's um, they've demonstrated a need. Your legislative priorities? Um, you know, I, I really 
uh, wouldn't say I necessarily have anything specific. Uh, I've served on appropriations, so clearly the budget has been one of my uh, priorities. Um, and I, I think that this is kind of where it all starts. I, when you put dollars behind programs, that kind of indicates where your priorities are at. All right, Senator Corey Brown, thanks, thanks. so much for joining us today. And I'm now joined by Representative Tom Jones. He's a Democrat from Viberg, but will soon be a senator when you come back. Welcome, sir. First of all, your overall thoughts on what you heard today. Well, I think this is uh, so much better than what I heard uh, two years ago in my first uh, encounter with a new budget. So uh, instead of the 10% cuts, now we're looking at doing some increases for uh, some very important parts of, uh, of our uh, expenses that we're going to have. Let's talk about some of those uncommitted dollars for fiscal year, year 2013, which is what we're in. We're looking at about 16 million next year, 10 million. Your thoughts on those uncommitted dollars? Well, the governor didn't, uh, he didn't spell out any uh, specifics that he wanted to do with that money, but I think he left that up to the legislature, and, and uh, I, for one, would like to make sure that we don't put those into another reserve. I think this is uh, some money that we've taken from us as taxpayers, and I think it's time to pay those back to the taxpayers in forms of uh, help to uh, um, health care, uh, education, and uh, I'm really glad to see the state employees get another boost again this year. We're still behind there, too. As you mentioned, we're seeing increases instead of cuts, 3% for education, 3% for state employees, Medicaid. Do you feel that that will be adequate? And I know it's too early to tell, but do you feel the legislature will go along with the, that number? Oh, I think that uh, they'll go along with it. Whether they'll increase it some more, uh, that remains to be seen. I would like to see uh, more increases, especially uh, along the, in the education field, and maybe some more help in the Medicaid field. After uh, voters decided to vote down the reform in education, do you anticipate some of those issues coming back up again? Well, if they do, they won't come in with a five-piece five, five package this time. I'm sure there'll be uh, separate bills for each item that they want to bring up. But uh, uh, that was, to me, a very poorly constructed bill, and uh, I'm, I was very pleased to see that the people were smart enough to uh, go along with the idea that this bill should not be passed. I know education near and dear to your heart. Before I say goodbye, any other issue that you'll be following closely? Well, I think the biggest thing that uh, I'll be probably looking at is what are we going to do? Uh, are we going to do anything with the uh, reserve cash funds? Uh, um, how much money do we have to store away uh, uh, that we do nothing but gain interest on and when, we got, when we have so many people that are needing help in, in uh, critical areas? Representative, thank you, sir, very much, and we'll see you back here in January. All right, Representative Tom Jones from Viberg, and Kara will throw it down to you. Thanks, Stephanie, and Senator Mark Johnston joins me now from Sioux Falls. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit at first your initial reaction to the governor's speech. Well, there's a lot of positive things to, to talk about. Uh, it makes me feel pretty good about the condition that South Dakota's in, uh, economy-wise. You know, we believe that we should grow our, our budget through job growth, and we've got a very broad sales tax. Very, it covers a lot of spectrums, but it's not very deep. And so what I saw today is uh, that South Dakota is really in pretty good shape. Some people were anticipating a little bit more on economic development perhaps in here? Were you disappointed they didn't really talk about that? You know, this is the governor's approach. You know, this is a recommendation that he's making to the citizens of South Dakota. We do have three branches of government, and, and while that is a plan, I don't think that's going to be the plan at the end of the day. Uh, we did, th there was some uh, uh, acknowledgement of economic development in this budget. I don't necessarily believe that maybe there was enough. Uh, certainly, uh, I was just doing some rough math, rough math in the back, and about 71, 72 percent of all the increases that we saw today were really enveloped into two places, taking care of people and education. And that, that kind of goes along the lines with our state budget uh, normally. But because of the vote on 1230, uh, excuse me, House Bill 12, 
30, the referral that we just came out of in November. I think we need to have a look, another discussion about uh, having a pool of money to uh, to address those 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 needs that we do have economically. And you you hinted at 1234, and yeah. with uh, and that's the education portion, the reforms. Um, do you think we're going to see an attempt to have more education reforms or separate them out a little? I think we're going to put that on pause. There's a lot of great work that was done by working groups across many aspects of the former House Bill 1234. I think those groups are going to continue to work on some of those, some of the pieces of it, but absolutely it's gone. There are some things that we need to do uh, to continue to get greater outcomes to make sure our students are college and career ready. Uh, I just had a conversation this morning with folks from the Teachers um, South Dakota Education Association, the School Board Administrators of South Dakota, the Associated School Boards of South Dakota. I'm having a meeting tomorrow morning in Sioux Falls with members of similar groups. And so everybody's talking. Not sure exactly where we're going to go for 2013, but most importantly, I think we're having discussions today for a more cohesive, uh, collaborative approach, possibly for the 2014 school district, or excuse me, uh, 2014 legislative year. But getting, you know, we're fully funding the formula this year where there's given a little bit more money in the FY13 budget for education, but. Um, a lot of conversations will go on between now and, and uh, when we leave here, March 8th. All right, Mark, Senator Johnston, thanks so much for being here. Stephanie, back to you. All right, thank you, Kara. I'm now joined by Representative Scott Munsterman from the Brookings area. Welcome, Representative. I want to talk about the 3% increase to education, but the 3.2% increase to the Board of Regents. Obviously, SDSU being up in your area, your thoughts? Well, it's nice to be in a position where we're actually adding. Uh, some revenue to, to some of these organizations and, and institutions and of course higher ed you know being a very important component to the Brookings economy uh, as well as just overall education in the state and so I think the folks back home will be um, enthusiastic about that of course nothing's a done deal and and through the legislative process uh, we have quite a quite a road to hoe uh, and to look at all the details of the budget uh, but overall I, I saw that as a positive as well as some of the other funding you know, through K-12 and, and some of that that's been proposed at this point. Now, one of the things the governor talked about, and you and I didn't discuss this, but it are some of those risk factors with the expansion in Medicaid and the drought and, you know, what direction Congress will decide to do. How concerned are you at this moment not knowing some of those issues? I mean, those are big factors. I mean, those are, I'm so glad that the governor brought that up today, and especially the depiction of of really the situation that the federal government is in. I mean, we all need to be very cognizant of that. Uh, and these are things that, that I guess I and, and many others have talked to people about looking ahead into the future, that, uh, you know, there's a fiscal situation there that uh, there's not much forgiveness there when it comes to these numbers. You know, you have to deal with it, and they're not dealing with it. And eventually, I do believe it's going to come back to us as a state. Uh, in terms of reduced uh, revenue from the federal government, uh, just like you know he talked about. So that is a very real factor in our minds. And as we continue to move forward in our budgeting process, we have been very conservative in our budgeting process. Um, and really, uh, it has been good for us to be that way because we do see some better revenue now. And we're returning South Dakota to a fiscal position of strength, which has been I think one of the hallmarks, and, and I'll congratulate the governor and the legislature on that the last two years, making hard decisions, you know, conservatively uh, projecting revenue and being in a position now where we actually do have some revenue that we can begin to look at, okay, now where do we reinvest? Um, and that's the position of financial strength that we need to be in and we need to continue to maintain. Uh, and as we look ahead into the future to things happening in the federal government and how that can impact us, the drought, some of these other economy things, uh, we have to maintain that conservatism that we are so, um, you know, familiar with in our state, and I think is one of our strengths in our state. Uh, and we need to maintain that mentality, and we can't go over the edge. Um, you mentioned the Medicaid expansion. Uh, I believe we do need to proceed cautiously. We need to get all the facts, and we need to understand what the rules are going to be that the federal government is handing to us. But once we get those facts and we get those rules and we understand that, then we need to weigh that against our moral obligation 
as a people, you know, should we be covering these people that are uninsured? How many are there? You know, and is there uh, a way that we can actually get that done uh, and fulfill what I would call our moral obligation um, as a group of people in this state? So there's a lot to talk about, uh, a lot of moving parts out there. There definitely is. Again, <laughs> Representative Scott Munsterman from the Brookings area, thank you for ta taking the time to come up and visit with us, and we'll see you back here in January. Thank you. All right. And that will conclude South Dakota Public Broadcasting's coverage of Governor Dennis Dugard's budget address for fiscal year 2014. Remember, this speech will re-air tonight at 1030 Central Time on SDPB Television. You can also watch it at your convenience online at sdpb.org. On behalf of everyone with SDPB, we thank you for tuning in. Goodbye. State House program funding provided by the South Dakota Bar Foundation, the educational and charitable arm of South Dakota lawyers and judges.